Okay, all right, we're going to get started then. It's just a few minutes into 7.30. So many wonderful faces in the crowd. Thank you all for coming. Um, good evening. Welcome to Greenlight Bookstore. My name is Jean. I'm the events coordinator here, and I was so thrilled um, to receive this event proposal to launch or to celebrate Safia el new collection, Girls That Never Die. So we'll be very So this is a very special edition of our Greenlight Bookstore Poetry Salon, hosted by Angel Nafis, who will be your <laughs> MC for the evening. So you're very lucky to be here. I'm very lucky to be hosting this. And uh, her fellow poets, Shira Ehrlichman, Jay Deshpande, and Ladan Osman. So you're in for an excellent evening. Before I turn things over to Angel, just a few housekeeping matters. Please keep your masks on for the entire time that you're in the store. We really appreciate this for the sake of everyone's health and our um, booksellers. Please turn off or silence your cell phones if you haven't already done so. Um, it's a really packed room tonight and it can get a little hot, so if you start to feel unwell, please know that we have water and place to, places to sit down in the back if you, if you need that space. Um, lastly, very importantly, we have, or not lastly, second to lastly, we have signed books available at the register. So grab your copy if you haven't already. And we will do a brief personalization line after the event if you want um, a personalization by Safia. But please know that we close our doors at 9 p.m., so we'll need to move that line very quickly. Um, lastly, lastly, um, this event is being recorded, and it will be available on our YouTube channel from tomorrow on, basically. And without further ado, your host for the evening, Angel Nafis, is the author of Black Girl Mansion, and her work has appeared in the Breakbeat Poets Anthology series and elsewhere. A Greenlight Bookstore alum, she is the founder and curator of the Greenlight Bookstore Poetry Salon. She'll run the show tonight and introduce our featured poets. So please give a warm round of applause and welcome our poets to the stage. executive functioning in charge, <laughs> and I can just come in and throw a little razzle-dazzle on it. Um, welcome to Greenlight Bookstore Poetry Salon. Um, thank you so much for coming and uh, packing it with such force. It's kind of intense and amazing. I don't know how many of you have been in rooms with other people, but it's like, I haven't, so this is beautiful, beautiful, wonderful. Um, just reiterating everything Jean said. Uh, if your phone is making noise, have it not. And I'm talking a lot of shit. I don't know. Mine might be. So let's go. <laughs> I, I recently crossed over from the Android moment. So I don't fully know how to work the iPhone. So we'll, it, we're, we're all learning together. So we'll see. Um, and, and buying books, you know, obviously Safia's, but Shira's got books here. Jay's got books yeah. here. Lovin's got books here. So make it happen. And then, you know, there's just also books and books and books. Buy books. <laughs> this shit is free. It will continue to be free should you buy books. So. Great, great things. Um, uh, my name's Angel. Uh, I'm <laughs> very thrilled. Uh, hold on. By the way, you're doing great. Your job is like, <laughs> crushing. So one of the things is like, whenever I like hold this up, what are you gonna do? <laughs> Safia and this love, we've got, um, and then this is your other part of your job. Whenever I say a name, you're going to do what, what you did with this thing. So, um, Laden Usman. Hey. Jay 
Hi, Gashpande. take a second and um, read the bio of the first author. I know it can be, I hate when people read my bio, so I apologize if you guys hate that. But we just have to, you know what I mean? It's like, you did all this shit, like, let's talk about it. You can't really just be resting on a laurel. Okay. Laudan Osman is the author of Exiles of Eden, winner of the Hurston Wright Legacy Award and the Kitchen Dweller's Testimony, winner of the Silverman Prize, a 2021 Whiting Award winner. She has received fellowships from the Landon Foundation, Kave Kanem, the Missioner Center, and the Fine Arts Work Center. Osman's first short film, Sam Underground, profiles Sam Diaz, a teenage busker who would become the 2020 American Idol. She's the co-director and writer of Son of the Soil, a short documentary on the complicated legacy of Malian Emperor Mansa Munsa. Osman's latest film, the, the Ascendance, a music short documentary series, is streaming now. She lives in New York. Um, there is, you'll see, like very shortly, um, maybe like the most what you see is what you get ass big up in the world <laughs> of this person. Um, I met Ludden at uh, Kaveh Khanum many years back. Um, and um, how should I say this? What a supreme, not just like comfort, but what a safety that every time I've met eyes with this person, touched in even just a little bit, I'm meeting the same person every single time. Mm. The same like core, even as shit changes, even as shit falls away, even as I don't know much about her on the for real for real other than her poems, which are crazy. <laughs> um, it's like the floor is still there in the room when I talk to her, when she speaks, she reads her poems. Um, it's a blessing to share a room with her. I feel I know the room is a real room if she's in the room. Uh, please give, give your love to her. Sweaty day. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. For everybody at Greenlight that um, organized this event for us, and um, I'm so honored to be here to celebrate Sophia. I've become really even more sensitive during the pandemic, so I, I might cry a few times. Um, Sophia, what do I want to say about Sophia? You will harm yourself if you dare to underestimate Ooh, her. Ooh, I think she has always been a sister to me, even as a stranger. She's one of the first people to host me um, when she lived in her studio in Harlem. And she was very much herself, you know, didn't like run around to hide anything. And everything about Safiya, mashallah, is beautiful. Like the way that she drapes things, the way that she keeps things around her place. And the most beautiful thing about Safiya is the way that she approaches thought. She really wants to understand who she is, but who she is in relation to other people. She wants to even, I remember we had this long conversation just walking around around New York. I didn't even know if we ate anything much that day. This was like in 2015. <laughs> Centuries ago. <laughs> <laughs> Safia was so generous, even in how she spoke about harm and in trying to under understand herself through her girlhood. Um, I just got um, her book. I'm so excited to read it. I know that it will move me in the ways that you know her work has moved me in the past. And so, anyway, uh, this is all for you, and it's our pleasure to be here to celebrate you. Thank you. 
Sophia asked me, I'll just read one short poem and then one new poem. And so this first one is from my first book, The Kitchen Goer's Testimony. And I'm reading it because Sophia requested it. <laughs> Troubled. I have a chill in my womb. I have a child in my wound. Everything is masked up. The sea doesn't blow. The wind rivers the sea in the wrong direction. How will I get along with this man wolfing me? How will I get alone? He heard me. It never bordered me before what I got as a regard. We used the hardest language. We cast threats. We'll born in hell. Some of us fall by the waist side, and some of us soar to the stars. Woo! All the poems that probably required an explanation, that was one, but that's okay. <laughs> that is okay. Uh, and so I'm writing a lot from the perspective of the sun, uh, in part because it's getting hot as hell and they're doing weird things. They're trying to harness energy around the sun and I just wondered, like, what does the sun think? Like, what is the sun thinking? You know, it's long dazzling witness of everything and its participation in everything and so I was like well shit <laughs> All right, it's the sun. and uh, also uh, because everything was so like lonely and I feel like when I'm lonely that's when I'm probably the strangest and the lustiest so I was like oh the sun will write to like a mortal why not and so this is sun to beloved a mortal I am down and all around you at the beach at noon, squinting at the mirror ocean, your bare and fragile torso, my sexless penetrations, your tattoos and scars vibrating in my spectrums, your skin dark, darker, proof that I touch you everywhere you allow me to go. I shimmer you wet, sweaty, sheening, in mirage. I am heating up your hair, the scent of your black hair exhausting, rising, never reaching where I am affixed and any way faceless, ferocious with want and giving, you and I both alike. The earth is hurtling past and still I stare, the moon in collusion, a mirror for my eyes. Do you remember how you looked for me at night, my back to you, safe then to search me? You stretched fathoms, farther than any human, probing, not thinking of your eyebrows or chest hair singeing. You held our song, no space, no time, in backlit teeth. Your form a mirror, a tiny mirror rendered giant by my regard, aimed so I could fix my gaze upon myself and away from you. I was roiling, producing storms, shaking your planet's grids and radios, everything black, blacking out, then bright, over bright, the light a scream when the sun saw its reflection. You stunned me, or I stunned me. I let go of you or we let go of we. Oh, how the earth sings for men who walked on the moon. But what about the man who left footprints on the sun?
Um, it's not fun. <laughs> very fun. It was funny when um, Jean at the beginning, just very kind, like just as a nice host, telling everyone, you know, if you, if you feel unwell, like, I'm like, I feel unwell! <laughs> it's happening, Jean! What should I do? Should I get water? <laughs> um, okay. It's happening. More poems, more feelings, more togetherness. We can do it. I believe in us. Um, this is the good part, is being together and feeling this way. Um, Jay Despande. <laughs> is the author of Love the Stranger and the chapbooks The Rest of My Body and the Umbrian Sonnets. His poems have appeared in American Poetry Review, New England Review, Agni, Denver Quarterly, and elsewhere. He is the winner of the 2015 Scotty Merrill Memorial Award and recipient of the, of the Wallace Stegner Fellowship of Poetry, a Kundi Mon Fellowship, and residencies at that fucking castle. <laughs> the white whale, right? Um, which I can't pronounce. My white, Sucatella? Pasta? Ray and Ari? But I'll know the one. Uh, Salts and Stall Arts Colony in Vermont Studio Center. Jay holds degrees from Harvard and Columbia. He leads the Brooklyn Poets Mentorship Program and teaches in the MFA programs at Sarah Lawrence College and Columbia University. Give it up for those facts. Yep. Um, Jay, I don't know if you know this. We have so much, which is like a blessing to my life, we have so much um, student crossover. Like, so many people who come into my workshop are fresh off a J workshop, and it's the best look. And everyone comes in um, excited because they were in your workshop or my workshop. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm like, way to get the palette cleansed and correct for me. Um, someone recently said to me, which I'm like, now, is this the only true thing? Um, you know everything you need to know about a writer who is a teacher by how they treat their students. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to know. Mm -hmm. the, whatever you're doing in those spaces, it's permissing people, it's permissing poems to keep happening. So I, I'm so grateful for your poems. And um, <clears throat> I'm so grateful that your poems and your person make poetry more possible holistically. Mm -hmm. holistically. Everybody feels good when they leave you. I feel good every time I see you. I'm so grateful for you being here. Please come up and, and give some love to Jay. also very much ties to um, what you said about this, this sense with Sophia that when you meet her you kind of know. Um, there's something about certain people and the way that they use language where you know that they are your sibling. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a way that that can occur. And there's something about beyond what happens on the page, which is extraordinary and constantly changing uh, inside this work. Like from the first time I met you, there's something about the way that you manipulate language and manipulate humor that I was like, this is one of my people. And it's an incredible feeling. Um, and I feel very lucky that I also got to spend more time with you just before the pandemic really set in. So it's amazing to be here with this right now. Um, I haven't usually been on screen for the last few years. I don't have any sense of time anymore. <laughs> like what month it is or how long I've been here. Uh, I might have just had a stroke. <laughs> so, you let me know what's going on. <laughs> I'm going to read um, some new poems. Uh, kind of popping around. I think that like one of the things that the pandemic has maybe done for me is that two big ideas that I kept ending up writing about were um, frustration and play. Mm -hmm. And those two sometimes find their way into each other. 
Um, so I've been trying to see how that can occur on the page. But first off, something that's not for that. I'll read kind of older poems, I think, to start and then to end, and then some new ones in between. This is called Kiwi. As if the flesh had come apart in my hands to tell of it, light come through the big third frame, then coming through deeper as I cut the skin away, so that it seemed deep green was an order of light unto itself. What brought at the center among seeds, its issue, could be revealed as the system I was going toward all this time. All this time, sharing a part of the fruit with distraction, but keeping the most for selfishness, trying to get to the generous heart, which tastes the same or doesn't quite, but adheres to the same principles. You won't lose yourself inside of me, one says, while another pass into it and when the arrow hurts, yield, but not to pain. No, not to pain, to knowing you are the arrow too. Mm -hmm. I'm mostly just going to hop into poems. Right? I'm not sure that I have to banter up for all these poems, so we'll see what we figure out as we go through. Um, this one is called Jenner, California. So it's just in Mendocino, north of San Francisco. Jenner, California. We stay in a room the ocean accepts as its accompaniment. Picture frame window, one bright line across it. Afterthought continuously, that the sound of crashing waves makes heard through the insulation like a film about apocalypse. Last night, the party, the ungentleness of love, of loving your friends, of loving too much what you think you are to your friends. Mm -hmm. Through the insulation, I know the kelp beds float red and slick and confident. The drugs wear off slowly, aria in a cavernous theater. To feel or to stop feeling, I would give everything. When I get up today, I will go outside and walk the cliff's edges, remembering a kind of script for wilderness and sadness. I'll watch sunsets thicken golds and purples, let everything growing be not just green, but what it is, wet from within. Staying on a little bit of the, um, the selfishness theme, um, I finally got to write a Narcissus poem. <laughs> They've all been Narcissus poems. <laughs> Narcissus. Look, that field goes moon and winsome every time my eyes turn to its grasses, many and available. I know and so admire in this field those mirrors, sea, field, sky, wall, handle. Look, if all of us are one, can it matter where I choose to lay a tenderness? God, imagination, youth recall, the rasp of ocean outside in cold July, can it matter? Sweetness of the light upon her, she who I desired so much, Already I have forgotten her name. To be human is, I think, to slip between. What can it matter, then, to find in myself the stirrings of a song? What, being part, no matter what, of the one common truth, my energy among the many, all of us who wake on the same road, slurring our sounds, proceeding to the same lake, One of the other things that I've been occupying myself with for the last few years shut in is studying psychoanalysis. Which do some real fun things to your phones. Let me tell you. Uh, so here's a, a little poem that's just trying to sort of unpack childhood. <laughs> <laughs> just that, it's my, 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 
story we'll go this way. This is called Before I Learned to Read. All those days at home shaped by outline. The mouth perched on a couch back. Eyes tracing the ceiling steps and ramps as if to walk across it, as if to walk on the fresh snow. And hunger was like looking out a window onto thick forest with that other wall. Each page in my coloring book began near perfect, but somewhere in the middle of any design, something fell away or broke apart. The purple running out, the border of the dragon's belly crossed. Again, the waste, hours sagging, afternoon on gray and mismatched wings. So I dreamed of other things. The alphabet stood always like the open door to my parents' bedroom. I could walk through it, put my hand to it, near the lintel and the jam. Tall enough to reach the knob, I could fasten it, then open it back up. But once I went inside, the parts of that world didn't hold together. A bed, a desk, a bureau. I could do nothing with it, saw no use. It was as though boredom made a mirror I couldn't quite pass through turning me back to myself, the same dullness. Even then, I must have somehow known that this would be my version of adulthood, some perfect dream held out for me, its golden cadence, but waiting madly for someone wiser to let me use what I already had. Definitely a poem that Saki is responsible for helping me figure out. <laughs> um, another kind of view of family, I just before pandemic, when I was last moving around the world, was um, I went to visit where my um, my ancestors on my mother's side had come from Poland and Lithuania to upstate New York to a town called Gloversville. Is anyone familiar with Gloversville? We spent time there. A little bit now. Yeah, yeah. It's like not one of the super well known now, but it, it's named for that reason. It was a glove making capital. Um, it's not anymore. <laughs> Visiting Lubbersville. It is March. Somebody told me that. Across the street at the dealership, freezing men open the doors of one car after another, looking in. The news plays over my head. It's someone's birthday. There's been a fire across the street at the dealership. All the cars display themselves, hoods up, gaping with a cardboard sign inside. Pain is his biggest obstacle now, the firefighter's wife reports. Long ago, someone named this place for a reason. My great-grandfather's work was so soft, it was almost unimaginable, almost Hollywood when you slipped it on your fingers. Now a gorge struck through with opioids, a brick factory so empty I think of threats. Men lean gently into conversation with strangers, anointing vacancies. In the town hall, if I wait long enough, I can find those court records of my prior generations, of a village founded on the beauty of the human hand. Mm -hmm how it looks in the skins and silks of others, how it feels with its pad of blood and the thumb or thick when it's full of money, what it does when it squeezes the air, how it kills a man. <laughs> six foot something, I know the color brown is sweet. This putrescence embarrasses no one. The petals treacly vessels jangling overhead yesterday have taken a hint and gone down into the real grit of things. 
were better than the sidewalk to speak making way. I could go on. I'd say love makes us amenable to certain minor probable disasters. But what I mean by love is spring. Over eager and almost enough to make me wake up and light the insides of my mouth a little more. The petals talking vivid now. They say, finish your work and come back to yeah. us. We want to be near us. We know which of our blossoms were once in you. Mm. You who are a flower machine. Wow. The scent of sweeter senders. The slobberiest part. Come on. <laughs> The Nation, the Seattle Times, and the New York Times, among others. She has been awarded the James Merrill Fellowship by the Vermont Studio Center, the Visions of Wellbeing Focus Fellowship at Air Serenby, and a residency by the Malay Colony Fellowship. Our fellowship. In November 2022, she'll be a McDowell Fellow. She lives in Brooklyn, where she runs in surreal life, a portable creativity school. And she added a little cute thing here. She cannot resist a bag of Skittles or a pickup game of soccer. <laughs> oh my god, the world's most wholesome lesbian in the world. Um, there's obviously so many things I could say about this person. I'm engaged to this person. That's why I called her pop moments ago. Um, I'm really excited for her to come up and read. Um, it just occurred to me, too, like the realness, mm. the thoughtfulness, tenderness, the spontaneity, the creativity, mm. the um, plugged inness. That it's like, of course, of course they're bringing her up. Of course that's who has been like fucking Captain Planet into like <laughs> our powers combined. Um, all of those things are in Safia. Um, back there. I'm pointing to back there, you know what that means. In the room back there, we were all gathered maskless. Um, uh, we were just kind of gathering ourselves, because uh, uh, this is lovely. I love what, Are you guys okay, by the way? This is great. We're like together, this is like semi normal. Um, but, right? Listen, after with that dude, say all the stuff. I'm going to have to like, Get a journal. Yeah. <laughs> Again. I thought I left that behind. I'm gonna have to get a fucking journal. Um, we were talking about how weird everything is and how uh, lucky we are to be able to be in a room together. And I kind of was like, hey, I know you guys probably have a plan of what you want to read, but I just want you to know, like, Greenlight is a really special space. I worked here for like a decade um, when I moved to the city. Uh, I grew up here. Uh, this is a really, really special book, so I've seen the, the staff change a million times over, and it's always so thoughtful, careful, tender, of the smartest, weirdest, most down-to-earth, like, just collaborative group of folks, the owners, I, I love. Um, the space I love, too, there's something charged about this actual physical location. You know, no shots to the other one location. <laughs> something underneath the floorboards happening here that's, like, really singular. Um, and... I encouraged them 
I know you have your plans of what you want to read, but like allow the space to move you to somewhere that you didn't expect. You know, if you hear each other read something, it makes you want to read something else. Um, and in the spirit of that kind of like trust in that unseen force that kind of guides us, guides our hands while we write, while we live. Um, I don't know someone who's more plugged into that than Shira. Uh, she is going to be reading tonight from something brand new. Um, she's a poet, but this bitch fucked around and wrote a novel. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. It's kind of a secret novel. Um, she read, she's read it to me. She read parts to this this angel over oh here, <laughs> and she then sent it to McDowell, and that's those are the three people who know about it. <laughs> so I, I really invite you all to just be present with each other, be present with Sophie, be present with Shira, be present with yourselves. Um, it's a scary time to like let your guard down and see mm. what happens. <laughs> it hasn't turned out great, um, but I'll say that this is the this is a moment. It's gonna be okay if you like let your guard down and like just go wherever she is about to take you. Please welcome Cheryl. Yeah. such generous writers, so tender, making me shake, just so beautiful. And Sakya, it's very difficult to talk about you or to you. <laughs> I hope everyone has told you that. <laughs> I don't know what to say, I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. That's because that's a spontaneity you're talking about, it's just disorganized love. <laughs> I think that there's the way I think about you and there's the way I feel around you. And the way I think about you is that you exemplify a type of industry that is not capitalism. <laughs> and it's not what I'm taught in school. And it's not what I was told. It's a type of focus and mission and quality control yeah. that is okay. so, that is so... Taste! <laughs> Um, it's so inspiring, and I think of you often. I think like I can sit down and write. You know, I can sit down and do this impossible task because you do it, and you're so generous about how lumpy it is and how beneficial it is. So thank you for being honest with us and like telling us what it's like for you. You know, to write. So that's how I think about you, and then just feeling. You know, I love what these two people said. I feel so, it's, it's actually bizarre how little time I've spent with you, because I feel so at ease, and I don't feel at ease, <laughs> in general. <laughs> so thank you for just the warmth, the sweetness, and I'm just looking forward, I'm looking forward to tearing this book up. Oh, I'm going to read this front to back. <laughs> oh my god, well, I'm going to do a split. I'm so excited. So please clap for Sophie. Okay, so I'm going to read this thing. I really thank you for being open to it. Um, and uh, I don't know. What? Here we are. <laughs> Who was it urging me to swim the dark water, jelly bulbs drifting at my crown? I want to say it was Miss Sheehan, my first librarian, who often read to us in front of a massive window of snow. Though come to think of it now, it may have been a painting. Anyway. Deep under anesthesia, my mind nowhere, my body open on a table, it might have been Miss Sheehan urging me along. Or was it the texture of Miss Sheehan, the spirit of her, which always felt so much like winter pines and milk warm off the stove? It could have been her essence, whispering with no voice, carry on, carry on, penny pie, like guiding me through a word, letter by letter. Or it might have been Ellie, my first dog, afraid of everything and going for it anyway, 
nose in the rose bushes, tongue dripping like linen off the side of her jaw, like a water slide, like a lily losing a single petal. If it wasn't Miss Sheehan, it was probably Ellie, whispering with no voice, carry on, carry on, Penny Pie, like begging for a stick to leave my grasp to shred the air, reminding me with her whole body, it is wonderful to retrieve, to be golden. <laughs> Under anesthesia, there is no world. It's a black Polaroid after black Polaroid. But even where there isn't a world, there's this deeply buried reflex to answer to your name. I kept hearing it. Penny, no voice, no world. And if I'm honest, it wasn't even my name anymore, seeing as I was now a dark expanse with no shoulders or eyes or heart. On the table, I certainly had all the things that make a person a person, even if what they were removing constituted as me, at least while it left. Once it hit the tray, it became a humanless polyp. It began its individual life, its individual death. Whoever, whatever, urged me to swim the dark water, it spoke no language because it simultaneously spoke every language. Imagine Mandarin, Urdu, English, Japanese, Thai, Greek, Nepali, Somali, Amharic, and Arabic all simultaneously coming through one speaker, but it makes sense. That's what it was like to be under, like my favorite librarian, my childhood dog, and all the languages of our planet guiding me along the lawn. But, and I want to be clear on this, it wasn't peachy. They were carrying me along the blackest water, or not quite water, but mud, if mud could think. Mm -hmm. I had no body, but I seemed to move through a thoughtful mud, as if on an out-of-control surfboard which would capsize, then blaze alive again. Only the gentle fragments of past loves could uphold me through the terror. And that's what's strange. You weren't there at all. Huh. Even though you have defined my life as a great love, and all of our friends jealously remark on it. And I fill diaries with gratitude for your curls and rump and startling <laughs> smile. You weren't a part of this. Mm -hmm. There was a moment I may have mentioned that jelly bulbs floated above and inside the darkness I was, not jellyfish, more like doorknobs of light. Mm -hmm. You weren't there. And only later, once I was awake, did I think to myself, you would have loved those strange jelly bulbs. Before the surgery, it was your voice maneuvering my fears towards restfulness, your hands massaging my lower back as if to emotionally prepare the polyps for their exit, you cooking a bloated casserole and whipping up Rice Krispie treats from scratch at 1 a.m. because the polyps demanded them. And even well before the diagnosis, back in our late 20s, perpetually ravenous and unsatisfied, but always together, so winning, even well before the diagnosis, it was you who sorted the mail and emptied the recycling bins, who bought the surprise movie tickets and knew instinctively when I didn't want to be touched or to be asked minor questions. A great love is in the details. You were meticulous at calling the cab before I thought to at replacing the molding sponge. And on that late night train from the city, you cussed out the big guy putting his hands on someone, but not before turning to that someone to lock eyes and ask her name, a way to call her out of the dark. Your gentleness pried her from him. We walked her home. It was summer and there were better things to do and nothing better to do than this. I held her hand while she sobbed beside us, not saying a word except her home address. And then I held her rump because it isn't arguably perfect. <laughs> In the black hereafter, under anesthesia, no one cries because no one exists. I didn't hear the surgeons talking about the farmer's market crop last Tuesday, or whatever surgeons discuss when in a comfortable lull. And much to my confusion, I didn't hear your voice pull me through, along, and finally out. I woke to you standing above me with a fistful of white daisies, ten balloons, nine red, one black, which you always included in every occasion to mark that original loss in my life, my sister, well. She too was absent from the void. Wave after wave, an opportunity for reunion, nothing. Well never came, never spoke. What is it that we expect from the void? That's the question I woke with. Your gap teeth never looked gappier. You lay an ice cube on my tongue, pulled a tin of raspberries out of your leather bag, and ate them slowly in front of me. A gift to watch you savor. I wish I could have focused on the surgeon's incoming words, but the void was still in my hair, my molars. I don't need to tell you what they found in there, in me. A ladder, the surgeon said. He was an ordinary man who couldn't have been enhanced, even by a gap in his teeth. His tone was the equivalent of a beige sofa. A ladder, but what's it called? He turned to surgeon number two, a mousy woman with wild blue eyes that didn't match her squeamishness. Jacob's ladder, she confirmed. Like the myth, I asked? Or like the toy? The toy. Oh. It's not a problem, Beige Sofa said. Just so you know, it has nine rungs, alternating blue, red, yellow, a ribbon to hold it all in place. Anyway, we retrieved it, and the polyps, of course. There were six. That's good, I said, and the word good was nothing. It meant absolutely nothing. It dissolved like a coin of Alka-Seltzer into the sea. 
four candles, a brick, some snow, a magazine. Which magazine? <laughs> I was curious to know what I brought back, like the void was a library. Not a reading magazine, the magazine of a gun. Beige, the most boringest man alive, was somehow bored with me. He stared at his clipboard. You did well. There's only a few more. Do you need me to go over the risks again? No, that's fine. I remember. You had been wary of my surgery for this exact reason. Didn't know what I might come back with or as. What we hold defines our hands, right? Isn't that what some sage said, some song? A skateboard, three river fish, four ocean fish, cartilage from a surgery occurring in room 4A of a hospital in Bingham, an abalone shell that's quite impressive in size, two abalone divers, a toy giraffe, a sealed deck of cards, your wedding ring. My wedding ring? I looked at my left hand. It was missing. It happens sometimes. We pick up our own signal. Beige was annoyed to be interrupted. There was more to read. Go ahead. You can give it to her. He nodded at you. I didn't like the way he spoke to you, but I did like the way you slipped my ring off of your own ring finger, where the two of them had co-conspired throughout my surgery, to put it back on mine. I liked that while I was in the void, my ring evaporated, or whatever it does, then manifested snuggled up to yours. I liked the thought that after months of worry about my surgery, you'd find yourself laughing hysterically in the waiting room at my small silver ring suddenly choking your finger. I liked that in a way, we were married again by the void. A toy piano, something about toys with you. Led Zeppelin's seventh album. I had to ask, which album? I hated Led Zeppelin. My sister loved Led Zeppelin. Presents, the surgeon said, and you snorted at the irony. We locked eyes and he kept rolling a conveyor belt of objects I'd somehow plucked from the blackness or perhaps had been deposited into me. However it is that the side effect occurs, I couldn't say. I'd heard of folks whose surgery wouldn't end because objects kept coming. After days of hoping it might stop, they had to be let go of, right there on the table. I heard of folks who brought back people, people they didn't know and people they did, people that had died and people in other cities, busy eating smoked salmon under an umbrella in the rain, then suddenly emerging from a stomach or a heart valve into a neon room populated by surgeons' aides and their teal towels. I'd heard of folks who only brought back one object and were haunted by its radiating meanings. I'd heard of folks who brought back nothing, no side effect at all, and felt smaller than before the incisions, felt lacking. Secretly, I'd hoped I'd bring back a beachfront property. <laughs> I didn't know how it worked, but if it had to happen, a home to replace our shithole at the intersection of loud and dangerous would have been perfect. I don't pray, but I threw a cheeky prayer up. Beachfront property. You hated it. Don't joke about this, you said, and your eyes couldn't hide your certainty that I'd die. I won't die, I said. Don't say die. Now I can't joke or speak? We ended up fucking, which was one way to end a squabble that hadn't quite bloomed into a full argument. Plus, you couldn't have handled the full argument. You were fragile at the notion that it wouldn't be you on the table, wrapped in the abyss and getting restocked with a cosmic vending machine. Beige read off 30 more items, some ceramic, some magnetic, some from as far away as Spain. After a long beige pause, the room stood still. Anything else, I asked? Your eyes, his eyes, connected. There was a weight to the air. A child. I must have misheard. You said what? A fish. A river fish? Or maybe another ocean fish? A child, no name. And this is where whatever holds the earth together filled my bones. Gravity or blood platelets or forgive me presence. The way you looked at me, expectant but undemanding, shocked but unsurprised. I had given you what I had not been able to give you before, and what they said the surgery would prevent me from ever giving you. She, I said, somehow knowing. Yes, Beige said. A strange gentleness fleshed him out, and his aura shifted browner like a fawn's coat, speckled with white gleams. I have to admit he glowed. I know you saw it too. Splashed by his light, his mousy co-surgeon was smoothed around her frazzled edges. She held a towel against her chest, her mouth pressed into a soft smile. Where is she? Where is everything? Everything is in storage, our glowing surgeon said. As you can imagine, we have to have a huge capacity, so it's all labeled and filed. What's returnable has been returned. As for the child, he paused and grew slightly browner, brown as uncreamed coffee, the light around him thicker, almost a cocoon now. The child needs claiming. You remember this part well, and I like the way you tell it better. Our straight friends over dinner or after a movie would gather the gorgeous audacity to say, we're trying. And we'd always erupt, 
into delight and questions, trying. Mm -hmm. You and I didn't have the money to try, mm -hmm. let alone the parts. We didn't have a marriage certificate yet or a nest egg. And though our every day was filled with all kinds of trying, when it came to a child, we could only want, and wanting is so different from trying. Mm -hmm. Trying is feet against the marathon turf, the heel smack of chasing your own best time. But to want is to exist out of time. There's no arrival. There's this perpetual gasping, thin memory of air, the question mark of breath. Of course, only the void could bring her. Only the placeless place created under anesthesia, where effort is benign, and love proliferates at unrecordable speeds and whispers and bulbs. You weren't there. Neither was Miss Sheehan, not really, not Ellie, not Wella. Not a single language but all of them at once, cacophonous and true, unmanageable and pulsing. So many murmurs, so much light. The braid of all these loves was the voice of the one coming. The child walked into our crowded post-surgery room. A six-year-old, freshly bathed, quiet in a red t-shirt. She was not of either one of us, but she had your eyes, your skepticism, your nervous kindness. All of the grown-ups emanated the question of her belonging, except for you. You looked me in the eye, then rummaged in your tin for the last raspberry, which you handed to her, which she took. King Book Award author honor. Uh, Sudanese by way of Washington, D.C., Safia received a 2015 Brunel International African Poetry Prize and was listed in the Forbes Africa's 2018 30 Under 30. Her work appears in Poetry Magazine, Kalu, the Academy of American Poets, Poma Day series, among others, and anthologies including the Breakbeat Poets, the New American Poetry, and the Age of Hip Hop. Her work has been translated into several languages and commissioned by Under Armour Guyana and the Bavarian State Ballet. With Fatima Asghar, she is the co-editor of the anthology, Halal, If You Hear Me. Her fellowships include with Lily and Dorothy Sargent Roseberg Fellowship from Poetry Foundation, Kaveh Khanum, and a Wallace Stegner Fellowship from Stanford University. Give up for those facts. <laughs> It's quite stressful. Um, <laughs> she's been so great for so long. <laughs> for so long. Um, I remember hearing about her like a fucking urban legend. <laughs> like I remember coming into the um, Urban Word office and like a her literally hearing a whisper from one kid to another saying, I hear she's representing Sudan at Laos. And I was like leaning in and trying to understand like like what could make everybody at this table go quiet. Um, and I'm quiet at the table. I'm never quiet at the table. Um, everybody here knows in some way or another, but it's worth repeating. And I said it to you back there. I'll say it again over and over. Um, I can't believe your age, and how much you've given us. If you didn't give us anything else, you've given us too much. Too much, a wealth, just a wealth. You know, in your personhood, in your poems, in your way. Um, <clears throat> I didn't know one could carry the things that your work carries and hold it in that particular way. I always thought if it was heavy, you had to like confess it or like it was he like you had to drop it, or, you know what I mean? And there's a there's a play 
and a curiosity and a very like, what does this button do? Mm -hmm. um, a freedom. You're not. Um, you're not like your work isn't, and you aren't. Your your person, your spirit isn't weighed down by what you're freighted with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sensation. It's amazing. It's amazing. You're one of one. You're one of one. No one can do what you do, but it isn't um, a stifling. It's like energizing. I feel empowered that I can't do what you can do. <laughs> I'm like, thank God she's doing it. Because I, I fucking can't. Because I can't. Um, your shine is my shine. Your love is my love. Um, I'm so, 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 so proud of you. I'm so, the proud isn't even the right word. I don't know what the word is for, for pride almost sounds, it's like you, pride almost feels like you have to have had something to do with what someone did. I feel very happily hands off by all of your shine. Um, I'm proud with you. I'm proud to watch you. I'm thrilled. I, I, I cannot wait for you to come up here and tear this bitch down. I love you. <laughs> Safia, hello. <laughs> Even five years ago, I would not recognize myself today. Married, gallon bags of animal bone and corn cobs in the freezer to boil for stock. I am far away from the cities of my girlhood, cool concrete of their steroids. The new therapist wants a list of compliments I give myself on behalf of those who love me. And all I can come up with is resourceful. For a time, I believed myself in love with all things which only meant I loved what I could make if I were free from what happened to my body. That man who would never touch me, kept distant and without danger by the barriers of fiction. Then I believed the work would save me. I have no real use now for those Greek myths. They're dead girls, women raped by men and animals. Today the door is locked. Today nobody is outside. Muscle cramping mid-lap in the dark blue water. Now I embroider flowers in dim colors in my new country of flowers, clumsy stitches through the stencil of an orchid, remembering my younger mouth pressed to a flute, unable to release the breath. I liked that he was a musician, fingers long as spring onions. As a child, I ruined my sweaters, the sleeves tugged down to cover my hand before touching any doorknob or handling coins. 
teenage, loitering, urgently lonely. The cotton t-shirts curled at their sliced hands. Now I am thick-fingered and practical as my mother and her mother. Smell of bleach against ceramic. Gone is Elle's humid little apartment. Violent stain on the bathroom tile. A bottle of crimson nail polish shattered long ago and leaving streaks like blood. Her dirty living room where I slept for nights on end, though my own apartment was nearby, cleaner. I can't imagine them. The poems that softened the hearts of gods. The poems that changed anything. That night, metal of the fire escape against my bare legs, I accepted my first cigarette, and she allowed me to tell the entire story without using the real words. The night cooling and gathered close. The way nothing ever feels truly clean in summer. And all I know about Eurydice is that she died. My every other fact about her is about him. Wow. <laughs> is called How to Say, it is a puzzle and it's written after Abishagi How to Say. In the divorce, I separate to two piles, books, English, love songs, Arabic, my angers, my schooling, my long repeating name, English, English, Arabic. I am someone's daughter. But I'm American girl. It shows in my short memory, my ahistoric glamour, my clumsy tongue when I forget the word for in Arabic. I sleep unbroken dark hours on airplanes home and dream I've missed my connecting flight. I dream a new and fluent mouth full of gauzy spots of Arabic. I dream my alternate selves, each with a face borrowed from photographs the girl who became my grandmother. Brows and body rounded and cursive like Arabic, but awake to the usual borderlands. I proud shining slivers of English to my mouth. Iris, crocus, inlet, heron. How dare I love a word without knowing it in Arabic? And what even is translation? Is immigration without irony? Safia means pure. All my life it's been true, even in my clouded air. Geneva. The song that this uh, poem refers to is Mama Number Five. <laughs> Geneva. It's 1999, and I remember the school bus in silence except for the song whose lyrics list the names of women. It's endless loop that year. In school, I track the brief switches into English. Enough to overhear about my clothes, my strangeness, testimonies from gym class that I run like an African. By silence, I mean that I did not speak the language, a trait that found me in the early countries and remained. And in gym class, I tug myself away from the steady rhythm of the group jog, ask my body to go, and it does, faster, and it understands my language. What has changed? What is different about the girl in that story? The language of the asking, the language of the body. I say run, and she unfurls roots. Faster, and she starts to cry. In our group text, Vesma says, I grieve most for our younger selves. That cloistering, that cosmic silence, the belief that if we were told in any detail what we weren't allowed to do, we would take from the details instructions for the doing. Wow. Told only, instead, don't. Never. Good girls don't. Older now and tending each kilo. Everything we allowed to be done to us in silence. To ask for help would be to speak, and of course we never spoke. Go. See her. Running. Little bird in full possession of that body. Little animal. Faster. Untouched. Of course I tell the story because I fell. Going too fast and tripped. Shot forward projectile, a hand put out to brace my pitch, hot spread of nerves registering the breaking bone, iodine, gypsum, plaster of Paris. Months later, 
clean slice through the shell of the cast, and my freed arm, grown used to the weight, floating upward like a balloon, like a hand raised to speak. Um. <laughs> anecdote worth sharing. Um, <laughs> early in the pandemic, uh, I watched The Sopranos yes. for the first time, <laughs> uh, courtesy of my beloved Christopher, who loved this show and was like, I would really like to rewatch The Sopranos with you. And I... Um, the second marriage proposal. I know. <laughs> but, you know, I historically don't have a lot of patience for, like, prestige boy dramas. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm watch The Sopranos. Um, but if only someone had told me all those years ago that The Sopranos is just a show about an insular diasporic community, I would have been watched it. I know those people. Um, so every night we would tune in and I would be like, oh my god, my uncles. Um, and at the time I was um, doing a 30-30 with my friend Hada where you try at least to write 30 poems in 30 days. And so, you know, it was a one of the first nights I started watching Sopranos and um, for a second after being like, what am I going to write a poem about today? Um, I was like, of course I'm going to write a poem about the Sopranos. It was only a matter of time. Um, so this poem is and is not about the Sopranos. <laughs> uh, it's called Tony Soprano's Tender Machismo. <laughs> um, also the most toxic thing about me is that I'm a Tony Soprano apologist. <laughs> I know him. Three buttons undone down the baobab chest. Quiet humility of the wisping hairline. I watch him cup a face in his great paw to kiss the cheek. Exact manners of my first beloved men. Sturdy and broken hearted as cattle. My uncles. Watches matting the thick hair of their left arms. Brother aged and fathering into my empty spaces. My father was gone and into that great room they poured. Wow. Big shouldered boys, hot streak of anger at each center. I was a child wealthy in shoulders to climb, swung from arm to heavy arm, tender booming of my name in that chorus of approving mouths, gifts shining and breakable in their hands, fairy science of the music box, tiny chime of each earring, bracelets narrow and silver as their silent injured wives. I am their smart girl and they are proud. I watch him, my uncle who is not mine, 13 years after the show stops airing, and I love him, like the child forgetting her abdicated father. He smiles like I delight him. My love justifies his every crime. I pretended not to hear how they talked, about bitches and gold diggers, the news stories with hurt girls naming their injuries, consensus that they are lying, that they must have been asking for it. I am home from college and stepping into their amber scent of cologne and old sweat, their wounded animal smell, their every tender misogyny for a quick kiss on the crown of my head. Now their girlfriends are my age, wow. now younger, and now the news about the famous predator floods the screen. And when one uncle changes the channel and mutters about a setup, I watch the flood take that room of piecemeal fathers where I've kept them installed for years. Its debris includes the stories I kept quiet. Everything that was done to me that I will not tell them. Includes every word tossed about to name women. How we all thought they didn't mean me. I was mothered by lonely women, some of them wives, some of them with plumes of smoke for husbands, all lonely, smelling of onions and milk, all mothers, some of them to children, some to old names, phantom girls acting out a life only half a life away. Instead, they clatter copper kitchenware with their bangles pushed up the arm, their fingernails rusted with henna and kneading raw lamb with salt with coriander. They take weak tea, upper lips sweating in the steam, hair unwound against the nape, 
my deities, each one, each sandal slapping against each stone heel, their funk of sandalwood and root. I worship the bright chiffon spun about each head, the coffee in the dowry china, the butter biscuits on a painted plate, crumbs suspended in eggshell demitas when they begin. I heard. People are saying. I saw it with my own eyes. Redacted's daughter. A scandal. She was wearing redacted. And not wearing redacted. Can you imagine? A shame. A shame. in the world. Wake up, bitch, we're getting waffles. <laughs> you can keep crying, but you're going out. My marriages, my alibis, my bright and hearty stalks of protein, and all I know of love I learned at 13, dialing Busma's home phone by heart to three-way call whatever boy, so that weeks later, when the phone bill came, only Busma's familiar number beside the time stamp, bearing my name. Busma herself staying awake for hours to hang up the phone after. You who send pictures of your rashes to the group text, and long voice notes from the bathtub, your laughter echoing against the tiles. You who scatter the world's map, piling into cheap buses and budget airlines, four of us asleep in my dorm bed, six of us overflowing my studio apartment, false lashes for weeks after like commas in my every pillowcase. <laughs> you clog my toilet and admit it. <laughs> you text me screenshots from the Gucci fashion show, getting rich so I can get you this. And when I lived alone, and that man followed me one night home from the sixth train, up Lexington and into the hallway, tried for hours to break open my front door. You took turns from all your cities, and stayed overnight with me on the phone for three days, snoring and murmuring in your sleep. Thank you.